Thanks for joining us here at Faith Online. We hope that you're both challenged and encouraged by today's message. And if you'd like to learn more about who we are as a church and how you can stay connected, head over to faithisyear.org right after this video. As you can see, we're in our fear series, and we're, we, we started that last week where we were talking about taking different fears, uh, fears that are, are kind of common and kind of some of the major fears that people have, and just seeing uh, what God's word has to say about those. And uh, if you were to kind of base our whole uh, series on one verse, it would be 2 Timothy 1.7, which just says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. You think for, for power? This morning, yeah, power of love and of a sound mind. Now, last week, Pastor Larry talked about probably one of the biggest fears that people have, and that's the, the fear of death or the fear uh, of dying. And we talked about that we as followers of Christ, we don't have to worry about that fear. We don't have to be afraid of death because we have the promise and the hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, go ahead and open your Bibles. Uh, i got two spots I want you to open to. Uh, first off, this is really easy to find. It's right there in the front of your Bible, Genesis chapter 1. Go there. And then also in John chapter 1. And we will read from there this morning. Go ahead and stand with me as you guys are flipping in your Bibles or punching that into your electronic device. If you don't have one this morning, uh, you can just follow along up here on the screen. So Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness, and he called the light day, and he called Darkness, night. And there was the evening and the morning, the first day. Now flip real quick over to John chapter 1, starting in verse number 1. It starts off the same way. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without them there was not anything that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome the light. This morning we're going to talk about the fear of darkness or being afraid of the dark. Let's pray. God, we love you so much that we are so thankful for your word, Lord. I, I pray tonight or this morning that this word that is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path, Lord, that your, your word would, would shine into our hearts, Lord. It would shine into our eyes, God, and you would reveal, Lord, the things that we must do, Lord, to be your people. Lord, I pray, Lord, that your word would minister to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So the fear of the dark, I think most of us in here, if, uh, if we were honest with one another, we can say that, hey, at least one point in our lives, we've all kind of been afraid of the dark, right? I mean, at least when you were kids, some of you may still be in denial and say it was only when you were kids, but I know the nightlight that you keep in your hallway really isn't for those late night bathroom trips. It's because you're afraid of the dark. I mean, if you think about it, we've all kind of, we've all been afraid of the dark. The darkness has this weird kind of way of making us think of all these crazy possibilities. 
We're afraid of that, the boogeyman that only comes out after, after sunset. You know, we may look under our, under our bed. We, we got to make sure the closet door is shut because monsters don't know how to open closets, right? Right? And so we're afraid of the dark. We act and we feel almost like this darkness has a power over us. See, it has a power that seems to, to change everything. I mean, think about it. A child that is afraid of the dark, this same child in the light or in the daytime is completely fearless. I mean, think about it. They're trying to learn how to ride a bike with the consequence of constant falling down, scabbing up their knees, but they don't care. They're not afraid. They hop right back on the bike going again. The same kid, absolutely no idea how to swim, but will jump right into the deep end not caring if you're wearing your swimsuit or not, you're going in too, right? Not afraid at all. But as soon as the sun goes down, this same fearless child is now overcome and now is powerless because of all the fear of this darkness that sets in. The darkness seems to have a power to change everything. Sometimes even the light isn't enough to help. I mean, think about it. You're in the woods and you have a flashlight. You have some light. But just beyond the reach of that light is darkness. And the things that might be beyond the reach of that light are scary. There's endless possibilities. You know, sometimes I wonder, does light really have power over the darkness? I mean, does it really? I mean, it's a crazy thought. But if you think about it, darkness, it just exists. If we were to cut these lights off right now, you would realize that it's still dark. The darkness is here. There's, there, there, there's sometimes where uh, the light, it just has its limitations, the edge of that flashlight, or maybe the battery life on that flashlight, right? Anybody ever been outside and your, your, your batteries begin to run out? Or if you've ever watched a scary movie, all of their batteries run out every time. <laughs> it's like, Seriously, do you buy batteries at the same place I do? Because you should shop somewhere else. You see, I know personally, you know, we have this fear of the dark. I mean, I can remember one time, or not one time, but many times when I was in elementary school, I had a friend. Uh, his name was Trey Villarreal, and he lived about five houses down from me, not very far at all. But in elementary school, apparently it seemed like it was very far. And I would go back and forth to his house all the time, no worries. But as soon as the sun was down and it was dark outside, man, you would have thought that I had just like busted out of prison and there was, there was helicopters chasing me and I was running. I never walked in the dark, always running. As fast as my short little chubby legs could carry me, because I was short and chubby when I was a kid, okay? You guys are laughing at me. You're laughing at me because I was a short, chubby kid. That's not right. But I would be running, and as soon as a car, realize, in a neighborhood, these cars were the same cars that were driving back and forth all day long. But now that it was night, these were like a secret army that was of a war that was only being fought at night. And this is not a joke, I promise you. When I would be running, when the car would get close enough to where I think that it could see me, I would drop down on the grass. This is a true story, I promise you. I'm, I'm, I'm revealing some of the inner secrets of my life here. I was afraid of the dark. It had a, it had a, a power over me. I mean, think about it. In the, in the dark, if you're sitting at your house, you don't even realize the ice machine in the freezer. But as soon as it's dark and you're the only one in the house, <laughs> something's coming to get you when that ice drops, right? Oh. Suddenly my freezer turned into a, a portal where monsters are coming to get me, right? Where you hear the wind blow on the outside. Wind's been blowing all day long. That tree has been there for years, scratching the side of your house. But now that you're alone and it's dark, now there's someone outside wanting to come and kill you, right? This darkness, it has this, it, it, this uneasy fear that comes along with it. It's disorienting. You don't realize what's going on around you, but we have no reason to fear because God has provided light. God has provided light. 
in our darkness. And this morning we want to look at just a few of these characteristics of light that, that God has, has provided for us. And, and if the, you look at the scriptures that we just read, it started all the way back in the beginning. In the beginning. Creation, it was full of darkness. That's all that was, was darkness. Everything that was in the universe was completely dark until God intervened. Until God intervened and with his voice, with just the word from his mouth, boom, light was created. Just, just that easy, one intervention, one word from the mouth of God and dark was changed, darkness was changed into light. Light was created to illuminate and to push back the darkness. And this, if you think about it, all the way back in the beginning, this was a display of hope, a display of, of, of a, a reason for us to look for the future that as God intervenes in the dark places, he will create his light. The crazy thing is, up to that point, there had been no light. There, there was no light. Like, it makes me wonder, like, did creation even realize it was dark? You see, the light has a, a way of doing that. The light, when it shines, it exposes our condition. Creation may have never realized that she was in complete darkness until God intervened and his word created the light. You see, in the same way is with you and me. The same way is with everyone in this world. We are in such darkness. Then scripture talks about even when we were born, we are born into darkness. In Romans chapter 1, it speaks of the effects of the, the darkening of our spirit due to sin. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says that our understanding is darkened. And in Matthew chapter 6, it says if our eyes are bad, your whole body is full of darkness. You see, each and every one of us, when we are born, we are in complete and utter darkness. We don't even realize the darkness and the evil and the bad that we are in. But just as it is in creation, with many of us, God intervenes. Amen. Isn't it great when God intervenes? You see, but with the word of God, we are given the law. And the law shines into our lives. And it is that point that we realize the darkness. We realize the darkness. But the sad thing is, if you really think about it, although externally, naturally, we're afraid of the dark, spiritually, we're afraid of the light. I mean, think about it. Think about it in your own life and in your own personal struggles. Think about it with your, your friends at work and your family members. Externally, we're afraid of the dark, but internally, we're afraid of the light. John chapter 3 and verse 19 says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead because their deeds were evil. See, although the light exposed our condition and it reveals to us our deeds, it reveals to us the darkness that lurks on the inside of us, the, the, the light, it, it, unfortunately, it doesn't enable us. The law, the light of the law doesn't enable us to do anything about it. However, God intervenes. And this time when God intervenes, he didn't intervene with the light of the law. He intervened with the light of his son, Jesus Christ. Isn't that an, an awesome intervention? In the light of, the, uh, of, of the, the word, it says that we read in John chapter 1 is the, the word put on flesh. And when the word put on flesh, that speaks of, of relationship. And now through this relationship, he walked with us. He felt with us. You see, man's heart was just like the world before God said, let there be light. The world was dark until God intervened. And man is dark until God intervenes. John 1, 9 says, Jesus, the true light, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Is here we can see the difference between just a dead religion and a relationship. 
we can see the difference here in these two different lights. You see, the light of the law was enough light to expose our darkness, enough uh, uh, light to, to uh, show us our evil and make us feel bad about that. However, it left us powerless to actually change that. However, the light of Jesus Christ, when when the word put on flesh and he dwelt among us, now we have the ability to do something about it. You see, it's like the religion, these laws, these rules, and these regulations, they're enough to to point out the wrong that you're doing, enough to, to point to you and make you feel bad about what your life looks like. However, the light of Jesus Christ didn't come to point at us and just make us feel bad, but instead for us to realize what we've done and to worship him for what he's given us. You see, there's a huge difference there. There's a huge difference. One leaves me feeling bad for what I can't do. The other leaves me worshiping him for what he has done. A huge difference. See, once the light has set us free from our darkness, The light doesn't just stop there. It's not finished with us yet. In Matthew chapter 5, it says, you are the light of the world. We, We can take that and we can contextualize that. I am the light of the world. This is Jesus speaking to his followers. If you're a follower here this morning, you can say, hey, I am the light of the world. That's what Jesus says about you right here in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot, say cannot with me, can not. It can not be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now that the light, Jesus Christ, has entered into your life, now you must shine your light. That's the second thing we want to look at about what light does, is not only does it reveal or expose our condition, but it reveals our surroundings. It reveals our surroundings. When the light shines around you, you look around and you realize, you get this, you get the the idea and you see that men and women around you are dying and going to hell. When we look at the darkness, that's what we should realize and and that should cause a, a feeling inside of us, an emotional response to that. That should be a saddening fact for you. Men and women are dying and going to hell. In our world today, we are surrounded by darkness. Everywhere you look, whether it's in the newspaper, on the television, on the internet, on the internet, all the evil, all the darkness. Yet Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 that we, you and I, that we are the light of the world. Ooh. What are we doing wrong that our light isn't shining? If I'm surrounded by darkness and I am the light because of what Jesus has done in my life, well, then why is there so much darkness around me? Why does it seem like the darkness has power over the light when I read in John chapter 1 that the dark has not overcome the light? My experience and what I'm reading, it seems to to be a contradiction here. You see, we pray, we fast, we humble ourselves. We We cling to that verse that if we would humble ourselves and pray, that he would heal our land, that And we hold on to that, but then we don't see it. And we're like, what is going on? Why is, if I am the light, why am I not shining? If you would, take a minute, turn to Isaiah chapter 58 with me. See, we're not the first people on the face of this planet to be faced with this predicament. 
we'll find that many of the same things that maybe you have said, maybe you've heard people say around you, maybe you've thought or maybe you've just felt these same things, uh, you'll find some of them right here in God's word. Isaiah chapter 58, starting in verse number two. This is God uh, speaking about the nation of Israel. It says, for day after day, they seek me out. They seem, if you like to write in your Bible sometimes, that word seem would be a good one to underline. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? You see, some of these things that he's quoting Israel is saying, they seem reasonable things to ask. Hey, God, we've fasted, we've prayed, and you didn't notice. We've humbled ourselves and you're not listening. What is going on? Some of you may have asked this very question yourself. Maybe you've heard people around you say these same things. See, in the next couple of verses, God issues a harsh indictment. He says, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please, and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. You see, I think that some people, just speaking about the American church, because that's my experience, that's what I see, that's the, the context of my life. I, 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 some people in the American church have got this idea that shining our light is, the, is to point out all the wrongs in other people's lives. To force our opinions upon others, to point our fingers at others under the cover of hey, I pray and I read my Bible and I go to church, that qualifies me to point out your wrongs. See, God, he told us to love him and he told us to love others. What if, what if we loved our spouses the way that we show love to the world, only interacting with them to point out what they do wrong? What if that's the way we loved our spouses? What if that's the way we loved our parents, we loved our children? What if that's the way we love those that are closest to us? those relationships probably wouldn't be very good. You see, but that's the way we show love to the world. That's what we, that's what we oftentimes do. You see, but, and we'll say, it's, that's just the truth. I'm just sharing the truth with you, brother. And sometimes that hurts. And I would say, yes, you are sharing the truth, but maybe that's the truth of the law, you can see, the truth of the law will point out your wrongs and it will make you feel bad about doing them. But the truth of Jesus Christ, word became flesh and dwelt among us. It was a willingness to come down with us and join with us and get into our mess and partner with people who aren't like us. See, that's what Jesus Christ did. So what truth are we sharing? Are we sharing the truth of Jesus Christ? Because that's the only truth that helps you. He keeps going in Isaiah. This is how God says to shine your light. If you're going to shine your light, you can just look right here. Isaiah chapter 58. We'll go with the latter part of verse number 6. It says, this, this is shining the light in God's eyes. To loose the chains of injustice. 
to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, to break every yoke? Is it not to share food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe him and to not turn away your own flesh and blood, then, there's another good word to underline, then, it means something had to take place before in order for what is coming to happen. Then, your light will break forth. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear, rear guard. They w- then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of the oppression, You do away with the pointing fingers and the malicious talk. And if you spend yourselves, spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. Then, 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 You see, the crazy thing about this church is our fear of the dark shouldn't keep us in here. Our fear of the dark should take us out there because we are the light. See, shining the light, it's going to do a couple of things. A couple of things that we are comfortable doing. You see, it's going to take us away from pointing fingers on Facebook. It's going to take us away from listening to the TV pundits tell us that it's dark outside. We know. We can look around. It's going to take us away. It's going to take us into the streets. It's going to take us into our neighborhoods. It's going to take us out of our sterile environments, away from our cul-de-sacs and under the bridges where the tent cities are downtown. We're going to have to shake dirty hands. You may not have enough hand sanitizer. It's going to be okay. It's going to cause us to not think about the election when we see the young lady walk into the abortion clinic. Instead, we're going to think about the pain, the regret, and the brokenness that she would deal with for the rest of her life. Our fear of the darkness shouldn't keep us in. It's got to take us out. But it's a promise from God. Then, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. Church, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. The thing is, is when you get out of this sterile environment and you actually go into the darkness, you will get a completely different view of what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did for you. Because he stepped down out of a truly sterile, truly holy environment. And he came down into the darkness and he got into your mess. And he shined the light into you so that you might see your condition. But he wants you to go and shine that light that he's given you to somebody else. You are the light of the world. If the world around you is dark, maybe you're hiding. John 1. It's in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him there was not anything that was made, and in him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome the light. Don't hide. Don't hide. The darkness has not. I think it's safe to say the darkness will not overcome the light. A 
as we close this morning, if you guys would just do me a favor, just everyone just stand to your feet. As I was studying uh, for this fear of the dark message, I came across some couple of really cool things that I want to conclude here with this morning. You see, we said in the beginning, God spoke words from his mouth, and that was a message of hope that this light would push back the darkness. And that, that we can hope in that, that God is going to continue to intervene and push back the darkness. What I found out, you know, there's actually two times in scripture where God darkened the sun. He removed the light in order to catch the attention of mankind. In Exodus chapter 10, darkness was the ninth plague. It was the plague just before the death of the firstborn. Then fast forward to Matthew chapter 27, verse number 45. Darkness came to the earth just before the death of Jesus Christ. You see, God would intervene into his creation and he would do this miraculous thing, even in the heavens, darkening the light to get our attention. See, this morning, some of you may have walked in here and your life is dark. You are in darkness. You see, in order to have light after darkness, there had to be the death of the firstborn. You see, both in Exodus and in Matthew chapter 27, it says there became darkness, then there was the death of the firstborn. If you're here this morning and you're in darkness, I want to tell you that you can believe in the death of the firstborn of God, Jesus Christ. He came here and he died for you so that you might have light, the light that was life and life to the fullest. 